So uh, I know it's a long day. So uh, before we actually get started, just, just want to, to, to ask you this question. Is this session for you? So if you are already an expert in deep learning, then go and have your beer. OK, but if you are pretty new to deep learning or you are new to machine learning, then this session is, is for you. So you, you sit back, relax. Um, for the next 60 minutes, I am going to show you a lot of stuff. I, had about, I have about 300 slides. So I'm going to run through that in 60 minutes. So, so this is going to be a very intensive uh, um, session. So go and grab your coffee. You, you still have time. You've got 30 seconds to grab your coffee. And then when you're back, we can, we can get started. OK, I think we can. It's almost time. We can, we can get started. So a very uh, good afternoon. My name is Wei Ming. So I, I come from a very, very warm country. So this kind of weather is perfect for me. So I come from Singapore. So uh, for the next 60 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about deep learning. So I think by now, you should have heard of this, this phrase, artificial intelligence. You have heard of machine learning. And then more recently, you heard about this thing called deep learning. So what is all the, the fuss about deep learning? And why is it important to you? So for the next 60 minutes, I'm going to explain to you the, all the core concepts behind deep learning so that after this session, you would be able to talk to your, your, your co-workers or your colleagues uh, in an intelligent manner. And then by the time they, they talk about deep learning, you would be able to actually talk to them with the correct terms. So, so let me just go through the agenda. So I have a lot of things to cover. So first of all, I want to cover what is deep learning, the concept behind deep learning. Now, when we talk about deep learning, we have to understand how neural network works. So I'm going to explain to you what is a neural network, what are the various components in a neural network, and how do you train a neural network using what we call weights and biases. And then I will talk about what are what we call activation functions and what are loss functions. How do you actually apply them? Um, how, how do they work? And then we'll talk about something that's very, very important. How, how, when, you are, when you're training your, your neural network, how do you actually optimize your, your model? And how do you actually optimize through something called back propagation? So I'm going to give you some examples. And this is a perfect time for you to have a quick revision of your calculus that you learned in, in your secondary schools. Do you call it secondary schools? In, in O levels. So in, in O level mathematics, you learn about dy, dx calculus, remember? So this is a good time for you to really understand why you need to do, learn dy, dx in your, in your, in your high school. Now, once we are done with the theory, uh, I'm going to show you some demos. So in particular, I'm going to use the TensorFlow and Keras framework uh, from Google to show you how to actually train deep learning networks. And then you can do actually some, do some really exciting demos. I'm going to show you that. So I'm going to show you how to actually use the MNIST data set to recognize handwritings. And I have actually built two Flutter applications. If you have an Android phone with you right now, uh, later on I'm going to flash the URL. You can download and install my APK onto your phone, and then I can steal your data. No, no. You, you, you can use my, my application, and then you can actually try writing on the screen, and then you'll recognize your handwriting. It's pretty cool. So if you want to try that, I'll flash the, the URL to you later on. Now, once that is done, I'll talk about how to train using your own images so that you can actually uh, put in photograph of yourself, your wife, your, your husband, um, so on and so forth, so that they can do facial recognition. Okay, so for, for this example, we're going to recognize some fruits, which I'll, I'll show you a demo later on. Now, uh, we will also use deep learning to implement uh, NLP, natural language processing, so that we can analyze some movie reviews, whether this is a positive or negative uh, movie review. Last but not least, I'll show you how to export your TensorFlow model to TensorFlow Lite so that you can actually do uh, inferencing on your mobile devices. Now, this session is going to be divided into 60% theory and 40% demo. So, so my aim is I want to finish all the theoretical part by 5 o'clock. And 5 o'clock onwards, I'm going to show you some, some cool demo so that you have time to, to try it out yourself if you want to. OK? So, so let's uh, get started. Now, when people talk about AI, two more terms always come along with AI. So, and that is AI, machine learning, and deep learning. I think by now, you should be very, very familiar with these three terms. 
So what is AI? AI is something that as long as it resembles some decision making by human beings, that is classified as AI. So it's very, it's the broadest. Now within AI, you have machine learning. And that's where you put into concepts, it put into practice the concepts that you learn in high school, linear regression, logistic regression, so on and so forth. Now a subset of machine learning is deep learning. And this is the focus of this talk. And I'm gonna to explain to you what is deep learning, what are the things you can do with it, and why this is important. Now, AI, are we there yet? So there's a, there's a joke in the industry. If it works, it's not AI. Now, let's go into the focus of, of this talk. What is deep learning? Now, generally speaking, uh, deep learning is a machine learning method that takes an input X and predicts an output Y. So, sounds very simple. So this is basically what you will be doing. So you have a set of inputs, and you have your outputs, your corresponding outputs. Your deep learning model basically tries to learn the relationships between the input and the output, and that is deep learning. Now, when we talk about deep learning, you have to talk about neural networks. So what is a neural network? So this is a neural network. Let me explain. Now, a neural network typically consists of the input layer. So this is where you input your data. Now, using the classic Titanic example, so your input layer may consist of inputs such as the age of the passenger, the class of cabin that he stays in, a number of siblings that he has, or number of parents or, 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 or children. And your output layer is typically the result, whether that passenger survived or did not survive that disaster. Now, in between the input layer and the output layer are your neural layers. And all the circles that you see here are called the neurons, or we sometimes call them nodes. Now, the inner layer, the, the layer that is between the input layer and the output layer, they are known as the hidden layers. They are hidden layers. And you typically can have many, many hidden layers in between the input layer and the output layer. Now, next thing, the weights and biases. Now, in a typical neural network, you have your neurons and you have your connections. If you look at this diagram, each node is connected to the next node. They are fully connected. Now, each connection has got a weight. So in this example, I have a 0 0.2 up there, I have a 0 0.1, I have a 0 0.6. Now, each node has what, has what we call a bias. So in this case, I have a 0 0.8, 0 0.12, 0 0.3. Now, in the initial stage of the training, all the weights and biases, they are randomly assigned. So at this moment, I randomly assign all the numbers here, the weights and biases. And the important thing to note here is that the goal of a neural network is to learn the weights of the network so that the predicted output is close to the target. So that is the main goal of your deep learning. Now, how do you actually calculate the values? So first of all, you take the weight and you multiply by the input. So you do that for each node and you sum them up and you add the bias of that node, of the next node. So after you have multiplied and summed them up, you put it here. So here's one example. So for example, for node number one, how do I get the, this value, 4.74? I take the H, which is the input, 18, multiply by the first connection, 0 0.2, plus the second input, which is the class, which is two in this example, multiply by the weight, so on, plus final bias, which is 0 0.8. So I multiply the weights plus the bias, I get a final value for this node, which is 4.74 at this stage. And I do that for the next node in the first hidden layer, and then the next node for the, for, the, for the same hidden layer. So this is what I do. Now, after multiplying the values and adding the bias, 
I feed it into an activation function. So what is an activation function? So an activation function basically transforms the result of multiplying the weights plus the bias into a new value. So that is the role of an activation function. So using this example, for example, I have, uh, after multiplying the weights plus the bias, I have 4.74. I put it into a mysterious activation function. I get a new value, 0 0.84. So this is what we call the activation function, and there are many, many different types of activation function. You, you, you guys following me so far? So far so good? Okay. Now, what is the use of, a, of an activation function? So the use of the activation function is to allow you to control or normalize the output of a neural network. Now, at this point, it is not, it's not really obvious what's the use of the activation function, but towards the end, for example, you're trying to predict whether a passenger in the Titanic example survives or not. So when you have an end result, you want to put it out to the output layer, you, would be, you, you, you want to, to generate the probability of the passenger surviving or not. So in this case, you should generate a result from zero to one. So you put it into an activation function so that the end result is a value between zero and one. So this is one of the uses of an activation function. Now, what are the various types of activation functions available that you can use? So there are three main types. Binary step activation function, linear activation, and non-linear activation functions. So let me just go through with you each of them. And I'll go through with you some of the commonly used activation functions that you can use in your, in your project. Now, the first one is what we call a binary step function. So whatever the inputs of your, your, your node, if the value is more than zero, you will output a one. If your value, if your input value is less than zero, you will output a zero. So it's toggles between zero and one. So this is called a binary step function. Now let me, let me give you one analogy. This binary step function is just like you are boiling some water in, a, in your kettle and you put your hand on the kettle. So as the temperature increases, it hits a point, a threshold, where you feel that it is too hot and you lift your hand off the kettle. So below the threshold temperature, you put your hand on the kettle, it is still okay. And then when it hits a certain threshold, you lift up your, your, your hand. So this is how binary step function works. Now, besides the binary step function, you also have the linear activation function. Now, so linear activation function looks like this. Now, in deep learning, usually we do not use linear activation function because if you use linear activation function, your neural network is basically just a linear regression model. So it, it doesn't really add anything to your neural network. So in, in neural network, uh, in deep learning, we usually don't use linear activation function. Now, besides linear, Activation function, you have your non-linear activation function. So what are some of the non-linear activation functions that you have? Now, the first one is what we call a sigmoid activation function. Now, if you look at this sigmoid activation function, it looks, uh, some of you may be fam very familiar with this. Now, if your input is more than zero, more than zero, you have a value that is more, is about 0 0.5, and then as you go, as your input value increases, it approaches a value close to one. If your input value is less than zero, you have a value that approaches zero. So this sigmoid activation function is very good for predicting probability. So you usually use a sigmoid activation function when you want to predict the end result. So this is also known as a logistic activation function. So for example, you want to predict whether a particular passenger survived that disaster. So you can use the sigmoid activation function, and then the end, end result may be a value from zero to one. Now, 
Besides the sigmoid activation function, you also have something called the softmax activation function. So this is very good for probability distribution output. So for example, you have an image and you want to predict the person in that image, um, whether it is a male or female. So in this case, I can use the softmax activation function so that the end result, the probability distribution that I generated, all adds up to one. So in this case, um, my softmax uh, activation function may return male 0 0.79 and female is 0 0.21. So the end result adds up to one. So this is how uh, the, the, the formula is derived. So for example, if I have three input values, one, two, three, I can feed it into a softmax activation function and the end result would look like this. Okay, so this is the softmax activation function. Now, besides the sigmoid activation function, you have the hyperbolic tangent activation function. Now, the main difference between the hyperbolic tangent and the sigmoid activation function is that if you look at the curve in red, that is the sigmoid function. So the curve in red, the value ranges from zero to one. So that's the probability. But for the hyperbolic tangent function, the value ranges from minus one to one. Okay, so. Now, there are some more non-linear activation functions that are commonly in use today. And the first one is called the ReLU, Rectified Linear Unit Activation Function. So if you compare the ReLU with the sigmoid activation function, you will realize that if the value is uh, less than zero, it will have a value that's close to zero. Now, for the ReLU activation function, if the value is less than zero, it straight away outputs a value that is zero. And if the value is greater than zero, this is a linear model. And interestingly, when, applied, when you apply this to a deep learning model, it is very, very effective. Now, one problem with the ReLU function is that a lot of uh, negative values are being uh, 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 chopped off because when your input is less than zero, it straight away outputs a value of zero. So this is the key disadvantage of uh, ReLU. So the researchers came up with something called the leaky ReLU. So leaky ReLU is very similar to ReLU except that it leaks. So let, let me show you that. So the chart on the left is ReLU. The chart on the right is the leaky ReLU. So when your input is less than zero, it leaks a little bit. It leaks a little bit. Now, at this juncture, it is good to summarize what we have learned. So in a typical neural network, we use our activation functions at all layers, all the hidden layers as well as the output layers. So we apply it here, we apply it here, we apply it here. So that is the use of an activation function. Now, so one more example. So at the output layer, if I want to find out the probability that a person is female and the probability that a person is male, I can apply the softmax activation function so that the probability adds up to one. Now, Here's one more scenario. If I want to predict whether a particular passenger survived that Titanic disaster, and I only want to have one output, I only want to know what is the probability of survival, I can simply apply the sigmoid activation function. So you, you, you see the difference? So if I want to have two different uh, probability distribution, I can use a softmax. If I only want to have a single probability, I can use a sigmoid. Now, later on, when I show you the code in TensorFlow and Keras, all this would be much more uh, obvious to you. So far, so good? Oh, you're already lost. Still alive? Okay, very good, very good. 
Next thing, loss functions. Loss functions. Now, after the neural network passes all its input all the way to the output, we need to evaluate how accurate our predictions are. That means towards the end, how does it compare with the actual output? So we measure this through a function called a loss function. Now, so what is a sample loss function? For example, if you are trying to do linear regression, you are trying to do a regression, solving a regression problem, you're trying to predict a value, you can use something called mean squared error to actually calculate how well, or, or, what is the, your, 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 your loss for your function. So the goal is to minimize the loss function. So you want to make your loss uh, as, as minimal as possible. Now, so the loss is basically a summation of all the errors that you have made for each example in your training or validation sets. And it shows how well the model is doing for these two sets. So unlike accuracy, loss is not a percentage, it's a number. So you want to keep this number as small as possible. Now, so let me show you some examples of a loss function. So if you are trying to predict a true or false kind of a, a problem, you, uh, this is what we call a binary classification problem, you use a loss function called the binary cross entropy. If you are trying to predict a multi-class, you're trying to solve a multi-class prediction problem, then you use something called the categorical cross entropy loss function. Now, it, it sounds difficult, but it's quite, actually quite easy to understand. Let, let me show you. And for regression problem, you use the mean squared error function. Now, so this is what is the, the, the significance behind cross entropy. So for example, when your true label is one, so for example, you are trying to predict whether a person survives or not. If the passenger survives, the output is one. But then if you are trying to predict the survival probability of this passenger and you get 0 0.12, if you predict that he has, if he actually survived, but then you predict that he did not survive, 0 0.12, your loss is pretty high. But if he actually survived and you predicted that he survived, your loss is actually kept to a minimal. So that's the meaning of cross entropy. So for binary cross entropy, you have this particular formula. For categorical cross entropy, you have another formula. Now, so in summary, we use activation function at each layer, and towards the end, we have a loss function, and we want to calculate how, bad, how badly or how well our model is performing at that stage. Now, what do you do next? What do you do next? So after you have trained your, your model, you put in all your input, you multiply, you get the output, and then you use the loss function to measure how well your model is performing, what do you do next? You want to go back and optimize. You want to go back to your weights and adjust. So let me give you one, one real life analogy. When you check into a hotel, you want to take a shower, what do you do? You go to the bathroom and then you turn on the tap. And then when you, when, when you initially turn on, it may be too cold. And what do you do? You may turn it all the way to the other side. And then if it gets too hot, you turn back. So when you are training your neural network, this is exactly what you are trying to do. So initially, we have a set of weights and biases. So we pass in all the inputs, and then we compare the output. Is my prediction correct? No, my prediction is way off. So I need to backtrack and update my weights. And this is the role of an optimizer. Optimizer. So what's the use of optimizer? So the use of the optimizer is to update the weights and biases. So that ultimately, after updating the weights and biases, you reduce your loss. 
Now, there are some commonly used optimizers in the industry. First is called the Stochastic Gradient Descent, or SGD. Next one is called Adagrad. And the third one is called Adam. So I'm going to explain to you how back propagation works using one example. So this is the uh, back propagation. I'm going to explain to you how it works. Now, so let's take a look at this example. So I have a neural network. And the actual output is male. So the value is 1 for male, 0 for, for female. And this is the result that I get, 0 0.13. So the prediction is way off. So I need to be able to go back and update all the weights and biases. So how do I do that? So I do that using a technique called back propagation. So this is how it works. So let me show you an example. Now, uh, so I'm going to show you some, some formulas. So this is a good time to bring back your, your, your O-level mathematics. Now, if you look at this diagram here, x is my input vector. So my inputs, all my, my nodes. And w is my weight, that's my set of weights. So the input vector multiplied by my weights generates what we call the computed target. So that's my prediction. And y is my target. And the difference between these two is my loss value. So you want to minimize your loss value. So I can express my loss value as a function of the weights. So far so good? Agree? Now, I am going to plot my loss function as a graph. So if you look at this graph here, my x-axis is my weights, and my y-axis is my loss, which is a function of my weights. Now, in high school, you learn that a point on the, on the, on the curve itself, the slope A is called the derivatives of F. So that is the gradient. What's the, the, that's the gradient. So the A on the right-hand side has got a positive gradient. And the A on the left-hand side has got a negative gradient. So what does the positivity and negativity tell you about the loss function? So if A is negative, or rather if A is positive, this means that a small increase in W will result in an increase of the loss. Do you agree? So if I increase my A, if my A is positive, a small increase in W will increase my loss. Likewise, if the A is negative, a small increase in W will result in a decrease of the loss. So the absolute value of A will tell you the magnitude of change, how fast it is changing. And so in this case, what we can deduce is that the derivative completely describes how the loss function evolves as you change the weights. And so this is important. If you want to reduce the loss, you want to move W a little in the opposite direction from the derivative. So I will show you the formula uh, shortly. Now, so let me give you one walkthrough. So let's walk through a simple example. So this is my input and my output. So I have x1, x2, and I have my output, which is y. So I have a set of data. And what I want to do now is that I want to input, I want to send x1 and x2 into my neural network and I want to train my neural network to learn the relationships between x1, x2, and the output y. Now, so this is what my graph will look like. Now, for simplicity, I'm going to leave out the bias. So I'm only going to focus on the weights. So my input is x1, x2, and my weights are w1, w2, and this is my output. Now, 
So my computed output y hat is equal to x1 w1 plus x2 w2. And my loss value is equal to y hat, which is my estimated, my, my computed output, minus the actual output I squared. So that's my loss value. Now, remember in a neural network, when you first start training, we will initialize the weights. So in this example, I am going to pick some random numbers. I'm going to throw some random numbers onto my, my W1, W2. And I will start computing. So my y hat is equal to x1 multiplied by W1 plus W2 multiplied by x2. And then I will get this value. I get 2.439 and I'm ready to calculate my loss value. So my loss value would be 2.439 minus the expected output, which is 6. I squared, I get this value. Now, so my loss value is pretty high. So the aim of back propagation would be, what can I do to the two weights so that I can reduce my loss value, so that I can make this as little as possible? Because if this is zero, that means that I have correctly predicted the output. So that is the aim. Now, let's now take some, do some differentiation. So you know that y hat, which is your computed value, is equal to x1, y, uh, sorry, x1, w1, plus x2, w2. And you know that your loss value is equal to y hat minus y square. So I'm going to expand this. It becomes y hat square plus 2y y hat plus y square. Now, I'm going to take partial differential of uh, dl dy hat. I get this. Everybody agree? If I, if I differentiate l with respect to y hat. I get this value. If I differentiate y hat with respect to w1, I get this value. If I differentiate y hat with respect to w2, I get this value. Now, what is the significance of doing all this? If I take all these formulas and plug it into my graph, what do I get? Basically, the y hat the w1 represents the rate of change of y hat with respect to weight 1. If I put it back into this connection here, the y hat the w2, it represents the rate of change of y hat with respect to w2. And then I have a final formula here. So the rate of change of the loss value with respect to y hat. Now, having established all these formulas, what do I want to do now? I want to be able to update my weights through something called SGD, Stochastic Gradient Descent. I want to go back, I want to gradually update my weight. So I have this formula. If I want to update W1, the first weight, I take the first weight minus. Why minus? Because re remember, I said that to reduce the loss, you, must ne you need to move W1 in the opposite direction. Multiply by the learning rate. Multiply by the rate of change of the loss value with respect to the weight 1. So, so this is what I have. And what now I can plug in the values. So I can, how do I know the L, the W1? I can get the DL, the, the Y hat, multiplied by the Y hat, the W1. And we already knew these two formulas. And now we can just plug in the values. And when we plug in the values, now I have the new W1 value, which is 1.1904. So this is the value that I have for my weight 1 after I do a back propagation. 
Likewise, I'm going to calculate uh, weight number two. So using the same formula, I am going to plug in the values for my x2, w2, and the y, and the learning rate, as well as the computed y hat. Now I have my new value for my w2. Now once I have calculated all these values, I will put it back into the graph, and I repeat the process again and again and again. If you have multiple input layers, uh, hidden layers, you have to backtrack again to, to calculate the new values for, for the, the weights in the previous layer. So in this example, I am showing you how to update using the SGD. Now, after doing all this calculation, that is the end result for one batch. And you have to go on to the next row of data, put in seven, eight, and then the output nine, and then you have to go through all this again. Now, when you finish all your rows in your data set, for example, you have 10,000 rows in your data set, that is considered one epoch. So that's one full cycle. Now, so when you talk about SGD, we talk about batch size and epoch. So the batch size is a number of samples processed before the model is updated. So in my previous example, my batch size is one, because after sending in one row of data, I straight away update my weight. The number of epochs is the number of complete passes through the training data set. So for example, if you have 10,000 rows in a data set and you have 10 epochs, so you will pass through the 10,000 rows and then you do that 10 times. So one simple example. So assume that you have a data set with 200 samples, 200 rows, and you choose a batch size of five and 1,000 epochs. So this means that your data set would be divided into 40 batches. So because 200 multiplied by five is 40 batches, and each with five samples. And the weights would be updated after you run through the five samples. And this also means that one epoch will evolve 40 batches or 40 updates to the model. And if you run that with 1,000 epochs, your weights are going to be updated uh, 1,000 times. So that is batch size and epochs. Now, there's a name for uh, the different batch size as well as, uh, or rather different batch size. So if your batch size is equal to the size of the training set, that means, for example, if your training set has got 200 rows and you only update your weights after 200 rows, that is called batch gradient descent. But if you set your batch size to be equal to one, that means after one row, you go, you, you go ahead and update your weights, that is called stochastic gradient descent. But if your batch size is between one and the size of training set, for example, your, your number of rows is 200 and you set it to 40, so that is called a mini batch gradient descent. Okay, so far so good. So that is how back propagation works. So, in summary, again, we use activation function at every, at every layer, and towards the end, we use the loss function to calculate how well our model is performing, and then we use an optimizer like the SGD so that we can actually backtrack and update the weights and biases so that our model is able to learn and make better predictions. Okay, so I think, okay, so it's about five o'clock, just, just nice. So we can do some demos now. Now, what are we gonna use for demos? I'm gonna use TensorFlow and Keras. So what is TensorFlow? So how many of you are actually familiar with TensorFlow, Any, anybody? In, 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 this, in this room? Okay, 
and Keras. So, so how many of you actually use Keras for your, for your deep learning? Or who actually uses TensorFlow? You've got very high threshold for pain. Nobody? No. Okay. Now, uh, TensorFlow is not easy to use because you need to really build all the graphs. To make life easier, you can use Keras. So Keras is basically a high-level API that wraps TensorFlow so that it makes your, 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 your work easier. Um, when it comes to building deep learning models, it's easier to, to, to build. So let me show you one, the first demo. So I'm, I'm going to show you how to build a um, artificial neural network using the means uh, MNIST dataset. So the MNIST dataset basically uh, comprises of 60,000 rows of data um, of handwritings. So uh, each image is represented in a 28 by 28 pixels uh, uh, file, and it shows the digits from 0 to 9. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use uh, Keras to basically load this data set so that I can fit it into a deep learning model so that I can actually train it so that I can do some predictions. So let me, let me show it to you. So this is the first example that we want to look at. Okay, so now, first thing first, we import all the relevant uh, uh, libraries and, and, and packages. Let me just run this. Okay, so I'm going to uh, clear the output. Okay, so I'm going to run it cell by cell. So I'm going to load the various packages. And then I'm going to load the training data. And as you can see here, I have 60,000 rows. And each image is 28 by 28 pixels. And the, each digit is represented, each point, each pixel of the digit is represented with a number from 0 to 255. And so if you, if you look at this, um, if this is the, if they can stretch to the eight uh, uh, columns, you'll be able to see the, the, the image pretty clearly. Anyway, so I'm going to print this out so, so that I can visualize the various digits. So obviously this is five, this is zero, this is four. And I'm going to reshape this so that I'm going to convert this into 60,000 rows and 784 nodes. Remember, my neural network has got the input layer, all, all, all the circles, all the nodes. So I'm going to flatten the images 28 by 28 into 784. I'm going to normalize them so that I'm going to convert the values from 0 to 255 to 0 to 1. So I'm going to normalize them. So you will get some values. I'm, I'm, I'm going to build my model. So does some of these things look familiar? Uh, in particular, the, the stuff on ReLU, softmax. So basically, I am trying to build a neural network with a few hidden layers. And at each layer, I'm going to apply a activation function. And the last layer is going to use softmax so that at the last output layer, I'm going to predict the probability that this image is from 0 to 9. So what is the probability uh, that this image is 0? What is the probability that this image is 1? So all the 10 probabilities would add up to 1. So I'm going to run this. And I want to check my model. So this is the various level layers in my model. And then. Does this look familiar? So this is the loss function. I want to know how to, to, to update this, uh, how, how to calculate the loss of my model. And optimizer, I mentioned that you can use SGD 
you can use Adam. So in this case, I use Adam. And I want to use the accuracy as the metrics to, to measure the performance. So I run it. And then I want to specify how many epochs I want to train, I, I, I want to run. I, what is the, my batch size? So let's run this. Now, for this particular data set, the training is pretty fast. Uh, if you have more sophisticated data, the training is going to take literally hours. Um, sometimes it is not uncommon to run the training over the weekends. So, and then, uh, how do you know that your, your machine is working really hard? You start to hear that your fan is spinning up, and then you see smoke, smoke coming out from your machine. Now, if you have a GPU, that would be ideal. If you have an NVIDIA GPU, uh, that would be really speed up the, the operation. So, my training is done, and my accuracy is not too bad, 97. And I want to evaluate. I want to see the, my performance. So, where is the answer? It's right at the bottom. Ah, don't worry about this. I want to plot a chart to show uh, my training and validation accuracy. So in the initial stage of training, my validation, which is in, in orange, is always higher than that of my training accuracy. But you reach a point where your training accuracy is going to overtake your validation accuracy. That's where overfitting occurs. That means your 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 weights are looking at your, at your training data and they are tying very closely to your training. And that's where you should preferably stop your training. So it's about maybe 11 epochs. So that's the, the, the ideal time to stop your training. I can plot my loss and I can find a sample data set. I can try it. I can send in a particular data set, so for example, index number 92, and then they predicted that this is digit number 9. So not too bad, not too bad. Now, I can also preserve my model that I have trained into a HD, H5, uh, HDF5 uh, file, and then I can load it back so that at a later stage, if I want to do some more predictions, I don't have to go through the whole training process again. Now, this is not really fun because all the images that you are testing against are from the data set that they supply. So why don't we use a, a real data, real uh, data so that we can actually use our hand to, to draw something. Now, this is what I've done. I have converted the TensorFlow model into a TensorFlow-like model so that I can do inferencing on the edge. So what I've done here is I have done this. Um, let me just jump a little bit. There you go. So I have used Flutter um, to make use of the TensorFlow Lite uh, file that I have converted. And I have written a very simple application that allows me to just basically draw on the, on the, on the screen itself. Now, I have compiled this into an APK. Uh, if, you, if you trust me, you can always download and install this onto an Android phone, and then you can try this out. But let me show you a demo. So I'm going to show, show you a, the demo on my uh, iPhone. So there you go. So I'm going to write something. One. Recognize. So it says one. And then I can scribble two, two, not too bad. So three. Are you, are you impressed? OK, never mind. <laughs> OK, next one, next one. I can also do some very simple uh, natural language processing. Now, what I have here is that I have uh, a model that 
is trained using the IMDB dataset movie reviews. I want to be able to uh, analyze the, the set of uh, reviews to, to, to tell myself whether this review of this particular movie is a positive or negative one. So let me, let me do the training very quickly. And let me just run it. And then we can, we can do some prediction. OK, so where are we? OK. OK, so. OK, so we are doing the training. Are we done? No, I think we are still doing. OK. 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 Let's try to do some prediction. Now, so let's say I have this particular review. This is an awful movie. So would it be a positive or negative? So it says that this is a negative movie review, which makes sense, right? So how about if we change this? This is a fantastic, fantastic movie. And then I run, it says, hey. Okay. Now what about what about this? This is an awfully good movie. Would this be positive or negative? May I guess? So let me let me run this. You are close. Okay. Now, uh, ba basically, I, I, I just want to show you something. Uh, for natural language processing, sometimes a simple artificial neural network is not the best solution. Why? Um, because when it comes to understanding languages, um, whatever things, when you read a sentence, whatever word that comes before this current word places a particular significance. So when human beings read, they, they actually read, and then as they read each word, the, the, the meaning of the previous word plays a very important role. So for, for deep learning, if you want to do something like um, natural language processing, it's always good to, to use something called RNN, Recurrent Neural Network, which is able to actually have some long short-term memory to, to remember the things that you have learned. OK, so this is the second demo. Next demo. Now, Dick's demo is a implementation of what we call a CNN, a convolutional neural network. But because we don't have much time, we, we, I, I, I don't have much time to explain to you the, the, how CNN works. But CNN is a type of neural network that is very, very suitable for uh, image processing. So what I've done here is I have trained a model to recognize fruits. Now, in my example here, in my example here, I have trained my model to recognize three different types of fruits, uh, banana, durian, and strawberry. So, and each category of fruit has got about three, 400 images. So what I have done is that I have trained it, and I'm not gonna train it here because it takes about one, two hours to train. So I'm gonna show you the model that I have already trained so let me just go back to here. There you go. So I'm going to import the model that I have trained. And I have uh, some sample images on, on, on my drive. So I have one image. So I'm going to run this. And it predicts that this is a banana. So, so basically, this is my output. So if it says two, then this is a banana, OK? And then uh, let me try some other uh, images. And it says that this is a strawberry, so uh, zero. So the probability is 0 0.6523, so on and so forth. 
Okay? And you, you might think that, hey, this is not really fun, right? This is not really fun. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at static images. So I've done something that I think is fun. I have written a Python program so that I can activate my, my webcam and then I can take a, a fruit and place it in front of my webcam and it will tell me what kind of uh, fruit is this. So um, Python fruit recognition. Okay, so let's hope it works. Okay, I'm going to bring out a durian from my bag. Okay. It says I'm a banana. So anyway. Okay. So it says I'm a durian. Okay, anyway. So let me bring up my 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 banana. Okay? So so it says I'm I'm a durian. And then I am a Okay. Just just imagine that it says banana. So I think it's because of the lighting. Uh, anyway, during, during. Uh, ah, so it says, hey. <laughs> let, let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you one thing. Uh, when it comes to uh, training uh, image recognizers, uh, durian and bananas are the most difficult to train. <laughs> Have you eaten a durian before? Yeah. How does it smell like? It smells like your socks that have not washed, you have not washed your socks for two weeks. That's the smell of durian. So anyway, it, it says that I look like, uh, anyway. So now, so, um, so instead of uh, fruits, what you can do is that you, if you take the source code, you can actually get the images of your co-workers or your colleagues. So you, you snap about 300 pictures of your, your, your colleagues and put it into this model and then you train and then you can actually uh, uh, um, put a, a camera in the office, and then when your, your colleague is back in the office, you can detect that his, detect his face, and then you can do something, something about it. So you oh, you want a banana? <laughs> wow. Can I eat it? <laughs> okay, so it says durian, and then it says... Are you sure this is a banana? <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> I'm going to return you to banana after this. Uh, so, but you, you get the idea. Now, in, in, in China, in China, um, they are very advanced in facial recognition. So if you jaywalk, if you jaywalk, um, they, they have big monitors uh, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the side of the road. So if you jaywalk, your, your face would be flashed onto the screen, and then you, you print out your name, and it says that you have been caught on camera, you have been jaywalking, and then they will minus your social credit score, and then you can no longer buy air tickets, uh, train tickets. So this is what it, what, what's going to happen, in, is what is happening in, 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 in China. One more demo. One more demo. So, let me see. Right, so, next one. Now, instead of training all the, uh, doing all the, getting all the images to train our model ourselves, uh, you can actually make use of models that have already been trained for you. So, in this particular example, um, I, I use a model that is trained by Google. It's called the Mobile Net. And I am using this on a mobile application. So let me show it to you, simulator. So object detection, there you go. Now, so for this application, I am able to click on this button and I want to select an image in my photos application and I click on this. So let's uh, select. I'm sure you know this guy, right? How about, uh, let me prove to you why durian is so difficult to train. So even Google cannot recognize durians. Can you see that? It says that this is a banana. 
Now, this model is not trained by me. It's trained by Google. Uh, they have the ability to recognize a lot of images. Uh, let me show you one more example. Um, so it says that uh, there is a tie. Uh, the confidence is 0 0.65. There is a person. Uh, there is a cell phone. Is there a cell phone? No, sometimes it's not 100% accurate. Like I said, if it, if it works, it's not AI. One more. And then you can have, like, for example, this. Uh, there's a car, there's a person, there's a bench. So you can, you can even recognize uh, images in the, in the background. And one last one. Um, cake. I don't know why they say that there are three cakes in, in the picture. Uh, there, there's one image that's really totally crazy. Let, let, let me ask you, what is this? What is this? Let, let me just verify that you guys are human beings. Uh, what, is, what is this? A glass, right? So guess what the, the, the train model will tell me. I'm going to select this. <laughs> so, so sometimes, sometimes uh, um, the, 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 the predictions are not always uh, accurate. OK. So I think we, we, we it's just, just perfect. I, I think this is 521. And then, uh, so in, in this uh, past one hour, I, I hope I have given you a, a, a clearer picture of what is deep learning. So what is the meaning of uh, activation functions? What is a loss function? What is an optimizer? Uh, what is a stochastic gradient descent? What is back propagation? And then you have some ideas of what are the things you can do with deep learning. So this is particularly interesting because you can actually train models that recognize phases. Now, in, in, in places like China, in, in Singapore, we have cameras. We have cameras placed in the front of the classroom. And they are able to actually take attendance of students without needing to, to do it manually. They can automatically zoom in on uh, capture the faces. And they can even analyze how attentive the students are as a way of feedback for how effective the teachers are. So, so if, if they detected that the students are always dozing off, something is wrong with the, with, with, with the teachers. So, so these are the things that you can build. Uh, hopefully, uh, after this, this talk, you can actually embark on some interesting projects. And then if you want the, if you want the slides, you can um, send me an email if you want to. And then I will, I, will, I will send you, if you want the source code, I can give you the source code. And if you cannot sleep at night, go to my website. <laughs> so, OK, I, I think we, that's all the time we have. I'll, I'll, I'll hang around. If you've got questions, uh, please feel free to, to, to come up and, and say hi. And then uh, whatever ideas you have, um, feel, feel free to share with me. And then whatever questions you have, well, I'll be more than happy to, to answer them. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you.